Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host, and hope you're all doing well out there. So I just read the book called A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes Revolutionizing Prevention, written by journalist Christina Marusik. And this relates to the massive amounts of chemicals we are exposed to when we're young and when we're old, basically all ages. And these chemicals are in everything. Everyday products that we all use, our food, water, containers, long chemicals, our makeup. And this is despite there being a link to cancer for many of these chemicals. And when I say link, I mean that there are varying degrees of strength, right? You might have a stronger link to cancer, it might be a weaker link, and it really depends on the evidence that you're able to gather. But I will say once an exposure is out there outside of that controlled environment and everybody's using it, it gets a lot harder and trickier to definitively say, oh yeah, there's a link there. And I'll point out that this is in the United States because many countries have already banned these chemicals because of the link to negative health consequences. But they aren't banned in the US. The question is, why aren't they? In today's episode, Christina will talk about our chemical existence, if you will, and the problem of overexposure to chemicals and how that links to cancer. She'll talk about testing or not testing <clears throat> these chemicals and why it's an uphill battle to remove them and lower our exposure. She'll mention the researchers and public health advocates actively working to reduce our exposure to these chemicals. And finally, she'll discuss what needs to happen to reduce or ban the chemicals. So what does the new war on cancer look like? She's going to tell us in the podcast. Now, I use the words public health here because this is a major public health issue. Again, public health referring to something at the population level, and this is a population-wide exposure. Somewhere during the pandemic, and perhaps when folks were fighting over masks and vaccine policies, the words public health triggered anger in a lot of people who are unhappy with pandemic policies. The words public health were seen as something negative to many, and they were reduced in many ways to COVID vaccines and face masks, and that's it. Uh, probably two of the most controversial topics of the pandemic, and perhaps even to this day. In many ways, the words public health became synonymous with government control and the loss of individual freedom. Public health became politicized, they said. And I just want to respond to that real quick here, because I think it's important. Public health has always, always been political. Always. You can dip into the history of how we fought off tobacco companies and their lobbyists and paid scientists to push through tobacco legislation. For example, for something like not being able to smoke cigarettes on commercial flights, which once upon a time, people had the right to do. So public health always involves some level of politics, whether it's state, local, or federal legislation at play. And since public health deals with the health of the population for which, for better or for worse, <laughs> we are all part of. It's about maintaining a viable equilibrium between protecting personal liberties, which is super important, super important in a democracy, and doing what's considered best for the population's health. And that, it's, it's hard to do. There's a lot of disagreement across the board often, but it can be done. Uh, you have to listen, you have to compromise. And oftentimes that requires some level, sometimes even a really small level, but some level of sacrificing personal freedom. For example, an individual can't smoke on a commercial plane anymore because the smoke exposure was considered harmful to the other passengers. So a law was passed to protect the passenger population. Why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out because I think everyone cares about public health issues. And public health really isn't a dirty word if you understand what it is. But not everyone cares deeply enough about the same public health issues. And some folks get angry about the idea of public health policy related to one topic, while perhaps being the strongest supporters for more public health legislation related to another topic. 
So I hope we just kind of think about that when, you know, we hear these cries to defund public health today and this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, public health is, is broad. It's not just COVID stuff. It's broad. And today is a public health topic. And that topic is the widespread chemical exposure in the United States. And maybe you feel strongly about it. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you think there's not enough evidence. Whatever, wherever you are, um, I'll be interested in hearing how you feel after you listen to this podcast. Okay, thanks for listening. And now I'm going to stop talking and shut my pie hole, so to speak, and connect to Christina. One second, guys. All right, everyone, we are connecting to author and journalist Christina Marusik, who wrote the book, A New War on Cancer, The Unlikely Heroes Revolutionizing Prevention. So thank you, Christina, for being here. And as I mentioned before we started recording, this is a topic I'm really interested in and haven't really dealt, like really dove into in a serious way. But before we start talking about all of that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in this topic? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here chatting with you today. Um, I came to this topic um, through a very personal experience. So when my younger sister was 25 years old, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And uh, that's very young for a cancer diagnosis. It really caught our whole family by surprise. Um, and it really changed the course of my life. My sister and I are very close. I'm um, two years older than her. And I was living abroad teaching English at the time and um, came home right away when she got her diagnosis, moved to Pittsburgh to move in with her, which is where I still live. She uh, was one of the lucky ones. She had her thyroid removed and went through treatment and has now been in remission for 10 years. Um, but at the time that she got her diagnosis, her doctor said that thyroid cancer usually runs in families, but uh, no one else in our family has ever had it. So her doctors mentioned in this kind of offhanded way that maybe um, you know, she was exposed to something in the environment that might have increased her cancer risk in that case. But when we asked for more information, they really didn't have any more to offer. And when we kind of went Googling on our own, we had a really hard time tracking down, you know, more information about environmental risk factors and um, how this might have happened if she didn't, if she wasn't genetically pre predisposed to thyroid cancer. And uh, I'm also an investigative reporter. So I took this question into my work and I wrote a five part series about, um, it was called Prescription for Prevention about uh, how Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania where my sister and I live have higher than national average rates of a handful of types of cancer that have strong links to um, pollution, exposure to pollution. And then I also dug into um, the region's history with industrial pollution and our kind of ongoing problems with um, air quality and water contamination, uh, mainly linked to the steel industry and steel manufacturing. Um, and that series won a couple of awards. And I got a really nice note from a publisher saying, hey, I think this topic is really important. Would you have any interest in expanding it into a book with a more national focus? Um, and so for very long years later, <laughs> this is that book. So um, I'm not, I know I'm not alone in that personal experience. Um, you know, one, I, one thing I learned writing the book was that one in three Americans gets a cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. So, you know, if it's not you, uh, it's someone you love. Um, and, you know, it's a heavy topic, but that really made me want to dig in a little more and try to figure out what's going on here. That's interesting. It's, it's, and your sister's doing okay now. She's great. Yeah. That's she good. has two super cute kids who Aww. I love being here too. Yeah. Um, we live close to each other and I get yeah. to hang out. I grew up on the opposite side of the state in um, the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area. So oh, yeah, we actually grew up there too. So my dad grew up in Pittsburgh, um, but we grew up in West Grove, which is this tiny little town near like, it's kind of closer to Westchester. Okay, yeah. Not too far from Yeah, Westchester. not too far. It's like an hour and a half away, like with everything. Yeah. yeah. So we, but we like opposing football teams, like Steelers and then the, you know, like Pennsylvania. People do, sometimes people who don't live in Pennsylvania think Pittsburgh and Philly are really close and they're actually like a five hour yeah, drive. Yeah, five hour drive. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> and uh, I actually, I was just reading an article. I can't remember which one. And I meant to look it up before I did this podcast, but I didn't. But there was some, it was an article about, the closing of a plant and they, um, they measured the rate of heart issues. And you may have seen it. 
and like yeah, I wrote I wrote one of those articles okay. <laughs> mine or you might have read Maybe. someone else's it was pretty widely reported on but yes the um Shenango Coke Works here in Pittsburgh um shut down uh I think it was maybe 2016 and in the years after that um there was this really dramatic decrease in emergency room visits and hospitalizations for respiratory and heart issues and um Initially, the local health department said, you know, we don't really think that's because of the plant closure. They had all these other kind of theories about why that might have happened. Um, and then some researchers not associated from New York, actually, who were not associated with the health department kind of tried to test all those theories and spent a long time, longer time looking at the data and looked at, you know, more years of data and said, no, this was a real, this was a real effect. People really got like significantly healthier um, after the closure of that plant. That's right. And that's, and now I, I remember when you said New York, cause I think they were from NYU or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So I've been interested in the, in the increasing rates of cancer in young people. And I've had doctors on this podcast, come on to talk about this trend. And a lot of people are, are talking about it now. And a couple that were on have linked it to early life exposures, you know, and then you might get cancers in your thirties and your forties. Um, and also they mention on healthy lifestyles, um, you know, the trend towards obesity and type two diabetes in younger ages, but no one really focused on chemicals, which, you know, was why I really wanted to dive into your work and your book. And then in the foreword of your book, you write the explanation for the increasing incidence of cancer lies in our world of chemicals. So I was wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so I think um, one thing that was really shocking to me when I started writing the book was this uh, steady rise in childhood and early adult cancers. Um, there are a couple of cancer types with strong links to um, pollution and chemical exposures like multiple myeloma that have also kind of just skyrocketed in the last 50 years. But when you look at charts for the United States and then also at the global level, um, they're just diagonal lines across the page, just steady, steady increases. And I spoke with an epidemiologist and pediatrician, um, Dr. Phil Landrigan, who ended up writing that forward to my book that you mentioned. Um, and he said something that was this total light bulb moment for me. He said, you know, when we talk about like lifestyle factors and the way they play into our cancer risk. Um, oftentimes that's kind of all we hear when we talk about, hear about cancer prevention, diet, exercise, not smoking. And that stuff is important, right? But he said, that stuff isn't really a factor for children. Like kids aren't generally drinking or smoking, right? They tend to kind of naturally like exercise. Um, and so he, he said that, uh, and and their parents might do those things, right? Like parents might drink or smoke while they're pregnant, but over time, over the same time period, the number of parents doing that has pretty dramatically decreased as awareness about the dangers of those behaviors has increased. So he really thinks that like, kids are kind of the canaries in the coal mine for all of this because kids are more vulnerable to these types of exposures. Um, they eat more, drink more, breathe more relative to their body size compared to adults. So um, their exposures are proportionately bigger. Their uh, most complex bodily systems are still developing and uh, that development requires lots of really precise things to happen in perfect sequence. And if something disrupts those delicate processes, it can cause problems, including increasing cancer risk. And there's also increasing evidence that our parents, grandparents, and even great grandparents' exposures to harmful chemicals can increase the risk of disease, either childhood cancer or, you know, could increase your risk of disease developing cancer in a, later in adulthood. Um, so, and he also said, the other thing um, he said that I thought was really insightful was that for some diseases, when we see it like a really rapid increase over time like that, it's because we've developed better diagnostic tools. And so we're diagnosing more of something that's always been happening. But for something like um, childhood leukemia, which is the most common type of childhood cancer, the basic diagnostic tools are the same now as they were in the 70s. So that can't totally explain away the rates. Um, but that one thing that has changed that, like you said, doc, like, tends to really get overlooked in these conversations is the number of manufactured chemicals we're all exposed to on a 
daily basis and kind of throughout our lives. And over the last 100 years, more than 300,000 new manufactured chemicals have been invented. And so those are, you know, brand new things that just didn't exist on the planet before that. And some of them are super helpful. Some of them have, you know, some of them treat cancer. Um, some of those chemicals saved my sister's life. Some of them have given lots of people access to clean and healthy drinking water. Um, they're not all bad, but most of them haven't been tested for safety, haven't been tested for their effects on kids and babies and fetuses. Um, and then even the ones that have tend to stick around. So in the last uh, 50 years in the United States, only five chemicals have been removed from the marketplace because they've been found to be harmful. And, you know, that means that there are dozens of carcinogens that we know are carcinogens that are still hanging around. Yeah. And I, I have a question about that down the line, like our terrible testing rate before something goes to market and in comparison. And as you write in our book and you point out multiple examples of other countries are doing it a lot better than we are. <laughs> and and I think it's important what you said also about um, timing of exposure, which people need to think about, like in public health, we call them critical periods. Like mm -hmm. if, if you get exposed to something during this time, you know, in childhood, for example, lots of development going on, that exposure could maybe cause a lot more harm than, you know, if you're older. And I also liked in your book how you presented causation, the image of a pie chart, which um, causation is hard, right? And it's it's hard for people to... Yeah. You're like, what caused this? You know, was it all these other underlying factors or this? Mm -hmm. And it sometimes you know, an exposure may not cause something awful like cancer in, in one person, you know, as it does in another person. It may depend on those other slices of the pie chart. But as you said in your book, which I think is good to point out, but if you still minimize your exposure at the community or population level, you're still going to lower those cancer risks, it, that risk of cancer, right? Like that's kind of the take home point. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That image was really helpful for me thinking about yeah. this because it does get a little confusing. You know, we science still isn't at the point where we can look at one person's cancer case and say, these are the four factors that caused cancer in this person. We just don't have that ability. But one theory of how cancer risk works is this pie chart thing you mentioned. It comes from epidemiology and they're called Rothman's causal pies, which um, sounds very, definitely sounds like it's in a textbook. Um, but the idea is that everybody has their own pie chart for cancer risk and we have our own unique mix of factors in there. And so everybody's looks a little different. Mine might be a uh, genetic predisposition to a certain type of cancer and um, growing up in a place of with lots of air pollution. It might include a slice that's like being exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, there might be a slice that's diet and exercise. But what's exciting or interesting to think about is that if even one of those pie slices goes missing, then cancer won't develop in that person. So if we can take out a slice that's common to a lot of people's pies, like exposure to industrial air pollution, for example, or exposure to chemicals that can raise your cancer risk through personal care products and makeup, um, then a lot fewer people will develop cancer. And we have lots of good data showing that that's true. So I, you know, people don't think about this um, chemicals at all. I mean, even the, like the experts I brought in really didn't mention this, you know, as a risk factor, but how prevalent do you think cancer causing chemical exposure is? Like how big of a problem do you think this is? Unfortunately, I think it's huge. So huge. we're there are a couple of categories of chemicals that can raise our cancer risk. Some are things like known carcinogens. You know, we know that benzene, um, which is found in like diesel exhaust and industrial air pollution, that is really clearly linked to leukemia. Benzene causes, the exposure causes cancer. Things like formaldehyde, that too. Formaldehyde sometimes turns up in like makeup and cosmetics um, or hair products. And we know that formaldehyde is a carcinogen. But then there's this whole other category of chemicals that are a little more nebulous and and very unreg much less regulated than known carcinogens which is endocrine disrupting chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals are things like phthalates and parabens and bpa um, so things you might have heard of or might see on labels that like a plastic thing says it's bpa free or sometimes you'll see like a lotion and it says no parabens um, those chemicals 
disrupt our body's natural hormonal processes. And our hormones are involved in regulating all kinds of things. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are linked to lots of health effects, including um, thyroid dysfunction, obesity, um, decreased efficacy of vaccines, particularly in kids. Um, And then research increasingly suggests that they might also be involved in hormone moderated cancers. So breast cancer, uh, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, hormones are involved in those processes. And so there's a growing body of research that says if endocrine disrupting chemicals, you know, disrupt the hormonal processes that regulate breast tissue, it can make them more likely to grow tumors and develop cancer. And those chemicals are really, really ubiquitous. They're in Uh, all kinds of stuff. They're really poorly understood. They're really poorly regulated. BPA is a good example. Um, You know, we see lots of plastic stuff that says BPA free, BPA free is like, has become an advertising tool. Um, Everyone kind of knows there's, there's a lot of consumer awareness that BPA is not great. You want to avoid it. Even if people don't exactly know why they're kind of like, Ooh, I think I don't want that one. Um, But they replaced BPA in most things with uh, a list of chemicals that are extremely chemically similar and probably carry the exact same health risks. So even when something says BPA free, they've just swapped out the BPA, generally speaking, for a replacement that is also an endocrine disrupting chemical. Um, The EPA was tasked with testing, coming up with a way to test and study endocrine disrupting chemicals with an eye to regulating them back in the 90s, I think in like 1996, um, they made a website about it, they said they had an office about it. And then since then, almost 20 years, uh, no, it is more than 20 years, uh, they have just failed to do it. The project has just not gotten off the ground. The agency has been sued multiple times by um, environmental and health organizations and courts have said yes, You committed to doing this and under, you know, the laws about reviewing harmful chemicals, you're obligated to do this, but the agency is just understaffed and under-resourced and it just still has not happened despite, you know, (laughs) multiple orders from judges saying you do need to do this. So these chemicals turn up in our food and in our drinking water, in our makeup and cleaning products, our personal care and household products. And there are a lot of these types of chemicals in plastic. Um, Plastic is a pretty major source of our exposure to these chemicals in various places in our lives. And then, um, you know, the other way we kind of get these chemicals in our body is through the air we breathe and in the buildings we inhabit. And one thing, you know, that caught me, caught my attention as I was reading your book, um, you mentioned that, first of all, as you just mentioned, this these are ubiquitous, like they're in things we use yeah. every day, constantly, we're constantly exposed. And we can't, you know, even just the air we breathe, right? Like, we yeah. can't, we can't run from that. Like, we're, we're always exposed. And you said that we um, tested, at least this was, I, I think, a statistic from 2010. Sorry, there was a horn, but it was a statistic from 2010, that the US, um, fewer than 1% has been tested in the U.S. for toxicity or safety. And as I went through the book, it was hard not to notice the many other countries that are doing more testing on these chemicals prior to them coming to market or Mm -hmm. even banning them. Like they are not used in another country because they're deemed unsafe, but they're still used here. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that was surprising to me when I was writing the book too. Um, So it's not, it's actually not like this everywhere. Um, In the United States, we're doing a particularly poor job, uh, excuse me, of testing for and regulating potentially harmful chemicals. And um, the EU is kind of the big example. They have much, much more stringent chemical regulations than we do. They've banned something like 2,400 chemicals in cosmetics. And in the United States, I think we've only banned nine. So it's a pretty vast difference. Um, There are a couple of reasons for that. I think the big one is the kind of power and size of the chemical lobby in the United States that just is kind of um, on principle uh, opposed to additional regulations. And so, you know, fights those and makes campaign donations and also helps to push this kind of anti-regulation agenda 
Florida that's become weirdly politicized in the United States. You know, when Donald Trump first took office, um, one of his first acts as president was an executive order that said, if you're going to propose a new regulation, you have to offer up two other ones in exchange to be repealed. And that was with no consideration for what these regulations protect the American people from, you know, um, and lots of other places have, you know, allow business to happen and have thriving economies. The European Union is a great example and also protect citizens from harmful chemicals. So it's not like these things can't coexist. Um, we're just not doing a great job here in the US. And I do think, I know this topic is really heavy and it sounds like, oh my gosh, these chemicals are everywhere. We're not regulating them. There's nothing to be done. It can feel like a little alarming um, or just depressing, but I think there are some really cool things happening that warrant hope right now. Um, and I do think, I hope that my book is really focused on solutions. So it's really focused on who is working to solve this problem and um, what are the pathways to you know, a safer world for all of us in a way that I think, I hope leaves readers feeling more hopeful, optimistic and um, empowered than <laughs> overwhelmed and in despair. But one example of, um, you know, a cool way that we're starting to tackle this is that state level regulations often end up standing in for federal regulations in the US. So for example, Washington state just recently passed a big ban on um, toxic chemicals and a whole bunch of consumer products that'll go into effect in 2025. And California just passed a ban on a handful of toxic food additives that um, several of which are linked to cancer. And these are things that are banned in most of the rest of the world already. That is a kind of landmark piece of legislation. And in both those cases, um, it's really tough for manufacturers to make like one special set of cereal or makeup for uh, that they're going to sell to people who live in Washington state and then another set to sell to everyone else. And that usually would end up costing more than just kind of taking it out of their formula and doing one version for everyone. So states are really stepping up um, and passing these bills that will end up protecting all of us. And then another, another sign of hope, I think, is that the draft of the new federal cancer moonshot plan uh, is the first one ever in like 50 years of the federal cancer moonshot to even really reference prevention in a meaningful way and acknowledge environmental factors. Um, I know there are some advocates working behind the scene to get more of that in there because they're, it's kind of short on concrete and specific things that will happen. Um, but, you know, previously, if prevention was mentioned at all, um, they just talked about early screening, which isn't actually prevention, right? That's just early detection. Um, so I think, you know, signs of hope, signs that things are starting to change. And I got that from your book. I did take like, you know, and all the stories, the people you profile, everyone was very inspiring um, and doing a lot of great work and producing a lot of really great research that can, you know, that'll be hard to dispute and that can change policy. It's interesting because, you know, when you think about the precautionary principle, right? And you'd like, well, maybe we shouldn't bring that chemical to market yet. We should test it. And other people are like, oh, it's fine. Bring it to market. But I always tell people, you know, but once it's out there, it's very yeah. hard to link it to, to prove causation and companies know this. And I, I do feel like they use that to their advantage because they're like, well, it's out there. There's so many confounding factors that we can say it's this, this, and this, it's not us. And that's mm -hmm. why it takes a long time. And as much as people, you know, sometimes you'll hear people kind of wave away anecdotal evidence as not very serious. And it's and it's a level of evidence. It's not, you know, we don't rank it very high, but this is an area where I think it, there's a lot of power in that collective anecdotes and anecdotal evidence. And just, a, there, I have a veterinarian in my family and actually my father, but like, for example, he'll be like, you know, I've seen all these these dogs with a certain type of lymphoma and they all use this pesticide in their lawn. And over the years, you're like, mm. you know, there, there's a link there, but the pesticide is still able to be used, right? Because yeah. we're like, there's so much power with these companies that have it. So I, so I, I think that that's just, you know, something I wanted to say. It, it's, it's, it's a fight. It's always a fight once they're out yeah. there, like they are in our country. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, and that story from your dad is fascinating, not surprising, but I, I think one, another thing that the kind of chemical industry does is 
uh, say, you know, there are all these confounding factors just because there's a cancer cluster in this town doesn't mean it was us. There's all this other stuff going on in this town. Um, but th those are the only real world uh, examples are kind of all we have when it comes to looking at harmful exposures. It's not ethical to put a bunch of people in a lab and dose them with pesticides or dose them with air pollution and then measure the outcomes. So we just don't have those kinds of studies when it comes to these kinds of risks. We have animal studies, we have some cellular studies that can tell us about, you know, are there changes to DNA when DNA, when bodies are exposed to this kind of substance. Um, but the industry loves to say like, well, it's not a trial. That's because we can't, exactly. we can't do that, right? Because yeah. the studies don't exist. Yeah, and so they kind of use that to their, I, I call it the exposure conundrum. They, they use that to their advantage. Like, well, it's not a controlled environment, you know. Well, you know, it's not causation. So on a more positive note, you tell us the stories of um, different people in your book who are doing great work, uniquely doing great work to prevent cancer. And, and you also bring up, I think, the important point that racism and classism and sexism play a role in this. And, you know, disadvantaged people are more impacted by this issue, which is it, it's not surprising. What is your vision for the new war on cancer? I think that my main takeaway, the main thing I learned while writing this book is that we are missing out on a huge opportunity to prevent many cases of cancer by ignoring this. So sometimes, you know, I'll see on social media um, in response to some of this content, someone will say something like, well, we can't live without plastic or we can't live without chemicals, um, which is a very kind of like all or nothing thinking. And actually what I'm saying is we're paying almost no attention to this now. If we pay even some attention to it, fewer people will end up getting cancer. Uh, right now, only seven to nine percent of global funds for cancer go toward prevention and all the rest goes toward treatments and cures. Um, there are, I would never say we should do less on the treatments and cures front, right? That saved my sister's life. I'm so grateful for how far we've come by putting all of these dollars and resources into develop developing better cancer treatments. Um, but imagine if we had put that same level of resources and investment into preventing cancer. Anyone who has survived cancer, my sister included, will tell you they would have rather had prevention than treatment. And there are a couple of reasons, I think, for that disparity in funding. One is that there's a ton of money to be made in investing in new cancer treatments and cancer cures. Uh, so this isn't going to just happen. And there's no big money to be made by investing in cancer prevention, unfortunately. So this isn't going to just naturally emerge from the marketplace. Some entrepreneur isn't going to come along and have some big prevention idea that's going to save us, which means it has to come from regulations. It just has to be done through policies and regulations. That's the only other path. Um, the other reason I think is that it's a lot easier to advocate for treatments than it is to advocate for prevention. Um, it's just the nature of prevention that we don't get to know who we prevented cancer in, right? We're not going to have a mom crying and hugging us and thanking us for preventing her kiddo from getting cancer. Um, whereas if you're asking people to pitch in for a treatment or a cure, you can put a picture of a child who has cancer on a t-shirt and on a Facebook page. And of course, we all feel sympathy and we all want to pitch in and help. And so it's tougher just to even advocate for prevention because um, a lot of times conversations about prevention end up being a kind of about like long-term statistical analysis and data and trends. And that's important, but it's hard to connect with emotionally. And so, um, you know, you mentioned the stories I told in my book. I really focused that there there's data and there's research in the book, but it's really focused on stories um, of people who've devoted their lives to this work. And that was really because I'm hoping to kind of put a face to cancer prevention and, you know, really convey that these are human stories too. Um, and if we were to take a more, if we were to fund and take a more systematic approach to protecting people from chemical exposures that raise their cancer risk, um, we could be as far in cancer prevention as we are in cancer treatment. Um, and that is a much more realistic way to approach, you know, any kind of serious war on cancer. I included this metaphor in the book, but when I was working on it and thinking about this war metaphor, you know, it occurred to me that 
if this was like a budget for an actual war, the way we're doing it right now would be like spending 90% of our resources on treating people who got hurt and only 10% of our, less than 10% of our resources on trying to stop them from getting hurt in the first place, which is just obviously not very effective. Yeah, I, 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 I like that metaphor. I thought it resonated. And obviously our military does spend a ton on prevention um, in that right. sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, I think this is an issue across the board. Uh, and I think you make a great point. It's because prevention is like not tangible. It feels like not serious for people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, there's so much benefit you can make by investing in it. But I always say it's like a gesture of investment in prevention. We all mm -hmm. kind of talk about it and like you point out people that are actually doing stuff concrete stuff but like for the most part we're like you know yeah you know prevention it's valuable but there's really like across the board in public health there's very little maybe not public health maybe like I should say our health system as a whole like it's just you know people aren't very serious about it and mm -hmm. we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world and we have we don't have very good health outcomes if you compare yeah. with relative countries and you would think that we would or even our maternal mortality rate and, and you would think that people would be like that's there's something strange going on like yeah what, yeah what is, what is it it's bad ROI <laughs> yeah, yeah it's exactly but we're not we're not really there yet I I, I don't know I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take for that percentage, uh, you know, that value to, and maybe it is putting a face to prevention. Maybe that's what it'll take or, or it'll help. So. And I think investment, I think, you know, uh, ultimately in a dream world, <laughs> in reality, um, where we're seeing wins is at these state level fights. And there have been a couple of um, federal bills aimed at, for example, banning specific pesticides that have strong links to diseases, including cancer. Um, so realistically, it's it's going to be piecemeal. And there are ways we can all pitch in to getting those kind of gradual changes in order. But in an ideal world, um, this would be something that you know, the, the federal cancer moonshot plan is really ambitious. It, the goals like to end cancer as a problem are incredibly lofty. And if, and if we're going to actually meet those, we're going to have to change that budget allocation, right? We're going to have to actually fund and strategize about prevention in a more meaningful way. And so I think in an ideal world, you know, that would be happening in a more kind of systematic top-down way. One thing that stood out in your book, um, I always, I'm saying that phrase too much, but I, I'm remembering lines and you said, I need, I need another phrase for that. But it's the frustration came through of these people who know what they're doing and they know the toxic chemicals to look for in their day-to-day -day lives. And mm -hmm. that made me think of the average citizen who, I, well, I don't want to say clueless, but maybe doesn't know about this stuff or doesn't pay that much attention and they're using all these things and they think they're okay. Then I think of the other crowd, you see this on Instagram sometimes, this term, I live a toxin-free lifestyle. And I'm like, well, no, you don't, because you, <laughs> you're like, it's impossible. You're like, we're, yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. And I also tell people, I call it the wellness paranoia syndrome. I'm like, try to live a healthy life. But remember, you could drive yourself crazy by yeah. trying to not get exposed to all of the things that are potentially harmful for you because that's how ubiquitous they are. Mm -hmm. And then you'll just die of stress because you, you can't, you can't <laughs> win that game. And so I, and then, so you write about the personal responsibility myth. And so I, I thought maybe this would be a good time. Like, can you tell people what that is and why that, that matters? Yeah, I think, you know, we're really conditioned, particularly as Americans that to kind of try to tackle these things as individuals. And I think particularly for women and for moms, when we start hearing this, we're like, um, oh, this is another thing for me to like obsessively read labels and start shopping and like try to protect the health of my kids. I think we're also told, you know, a lot of public health messaging around cancer prevention is very focused on individual behaviors, diet and exercise and not smoking. And that stuff really important, really good for us for lots of reasons beyond our cancer risk, but just, they're just not the only things. And a lot of uh, the things that impact our cancer risk are kind of outside of our ability to individually control. So the book is really about how can we as individuals kind of collectively advocate for meaningful systemic changes that would make us all safer. And you mentioned that, you know, I'm interviewing people for the book who have 20 years of expertise in this. They've 
you know, have PhDs in this subject matter. And I'm asking them like, so how do you, does this change how you shop for food for your kids? And they're like, oh, I just pick a couple easy things and try not to get too obsessive and keep pushing for systemic change because that's the only way it's going to actually get done. And so I think it's really, I really try to emphasize you know, people get freaked out by this. They want to do something. And there are some things we can all do uh, while we push for these bigger changes that'll make us all safer, um, that can make us safer on the individual and family level. And um, I really try to tell people, you mentioned that kind of toxin-free lifestyle, it, social media influencer thing. Um, I agree with you. You know, the people who have like real expertise in this are out here saying, um, oh, it's not possible. It's not actually possible. You could know everything there is to know about this and you cannot 100% protect yourself from these chemicals because they're just everywhere. Um, but there are some things we can do, you know, steps we can take that can be a little comforting and reassuring in the meantime. Um, I share a lot of those in the book, but a couple simple ones are uh, using an indoor air filter in your home. Um, HEPA filter is best, but they can be really expensive, but there's a cool DIY version where you can fit a HEPA filter into a box fan. If you Google uh, HEPA filter I I box saw that fan. on Instagram, right yeah. Up. Yeah. Um, the, the other one is investing in a good water filter. Um, the Environmental Working Group is a nonprofit that does a lot of advocacy around toxic chemicals and um, consumer protections. And they recently tested a bunch of home pitcher filters to see which ones remove PFAS. Uh, they're also called forever chemicals. Those are endocrine disrupting chemicals that are linked to kidney and testicular cancer. And a recent study found that they're in 45% of American tap water which is really high. Um, so they tested a bunch of home water pitcher filters and said um, which ones take out PFAS. And uh, they found three brands that do, lots of brands that don't. The ones I remember that do are Zero Water Filters, Berkey Travel Filters, and Clearly Filtered filters. Um, so good air filter, good water filter, um, eating organic when you can. Pesticides actually are um, a significant source of exposure, can be. They're, the Environmental Working Group has a list online. They call it the dirty dozen of which um, types of produce are most likely to hang on to pesticides. So if you can't afford your whole grocery bill organic, you can look at that list and kind of prioritize the produce that is most likely to contain high levels of pesticides after being treated with them um, and swapping out some of your personal care products for less toxic stuff. So uh, there are a couple of apps that are really helpful toward this end. Uh, one is Environmental Working Group's Healthy Living app. Another one is called Clearia. That's, uh, it's like a Chrome browser extension. And if you install it in Chrome and then you're shopping for personal care products on like Amazon or Walmart, it'll pull up um, flagged ingredients that might be concerning, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's a made safe, which is a database of products they've verified as being free of a whole bunch of toxic ingredients. And the way that I have found this easiest to do is instead of freaking out and throwing away everything I own and starting from scratch, um, I, as I was writing the book and learning about all this, just kind of waited until I was running out of something. And then I would um, use that as an opportunity to treat myself to a little less toxic upgrade. And my, the easiest way for me to do it was I'd go into that environmental working group, healthy living app, and I just type in mascara or shampoo or whatever I was looking for. And then they rank things based on um, what ingredients are in there. And they also give like a seal of approval to products that are free of a long list of concerning ingredients. Healthy. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, go, I would go read some reviews and pick some things. There's some trial and error when you're trying new stuff, but sure, um, sure. doing it gradually feels a lot more accessible, but really, okay. I started talking about individual actions, but really you asked me about the myth of personal responsibility. And I do want to emphasize that, um, you know, <laughs> there are a couple things we can do, but it's not fair to ask us to do this. And this isn't actually a problem we can solve by right. becoming obsessive consumers. Right. It's something that has to be solved through collective action and policy changes. I'm going to ask you about that in a second, like what your top recommendations are for collective population level actions are. But I also wanted to point this out because it's interesting and it's something people should know that companies often push these personal responsibility initiatives. And you mentioned in your book, the Keep America Beautiful, not for profit that was formed by a group of companies, you know, 
because they're they they don't take responsibility that way. They tell mm-hmm. you, hey, well, it's your fault. You you can help, you know, prevent plastics from being everywhere. And yet they're they can do a lot right on their end. So I think it's just something just to put on people's radar and have them think about these things. Yes. And in that particular example, um, the the group of companies that formed the Keep America Beautiful mm-hmm. uh like coalition and did that crying Indian commercial and yeah. really kind of leveraged Americans guilt. Emotional. Over. Yeah. Um, they were simultaneously behind the scenes, successfully lobbying against policies that would have made the companies that use plastic packaging responsible for its disposal. Wow. So they were directly creating the plastic pollution crisis. We now find ourselves in yeah. while simultaneously telling consumers this is because you littered. <laughs> like this is your problem, not us who are manufacturing, you know, billions of tons of this material and refusing to be responsible for its cleanup. The same kind of narrative is true with the carbon footprint. Um, that that phrase has become really like entrenched in our dialogue about climate change. And um, BP invented that phrase. And the year they invented the idea of the carbon footprint, they put up a carbon footprint calculator on their website and told consumers to mind their carbon diet. Um, and meanwhile, you know, they're one of the uh, 70 companies that are, res- or one of the 100 companies that are responsible for 70% of climate warming emissions. <laughs> and they were the same year that they put out the carbon footprint stuff we're only putting 2% of their overall budget into renewables. So they were behind the scenes creating this crisis and then in a public facing way telling consumers, this isn't about us or about the big picture. This is about you and your habits. And you know that's really been effective because people feel guilt and they feel kind of obsessive about their recycling habits. Um, and actually, if we all took that energy we have worrying about our personal behaviors and our personal responsibility and directed that energy toward pushing for systemic change, we could get so much further, so much faster. Yeah. It's a, it's like a dark comedy. It's like, uh, (laughs) it's not funny, but you're like, Oh my gosh. Um, (laughs) corporations. Uh, so let's talk solutions, uh, at the, I guess, systemic level, population level. What, do you think are some of the top recommendations, things that we can do um, that would make a difference? I think I mentioned that, you know, it can feel frustrating um, how change slow can be at the federal level, but that there's a lot happening at the state level. Um, In terms of, you know, what people can do right now, um, the things I recommend are telling your lawmakers that this issue is important to you, that cancer prevention and chemical regulation, cancer prevention through chemical regulation are important to their constituents. So that goes for your local lawmakers and your state lawmakers and your federal lawmakers. I know I was just talking to um, someone who works at the state level, and she was saying that they very rarely hear from people. They really rarely hear from constituents anymore. And so when they do, they really take note. It's a big deal. If they hear from three people who say something, they assume those three people represent hundreds of people who didn't bother reaching out. So I know that sounds, (laughs) we all get so sick of hearing contact your lawmakers, um, but it actually can do more than you think. Because you think like when I hear it, I'm like, "Uh, I could write, but they're not going to read my letter. It's like, I'm going to go to spam. That's really good to hear. Yeah, especially if you, um, I mean, you could do it on social media, you could do it with a phone call, you could do it in email, you know, it can be, doesn't have to be like this huge undertaking can be pretty straightforward just to say, hey, I'm worried about this. Um, You could also send them a copy of my book, (laughs) your legislators hear a lot from the chemical lobby, and they get a ton of materials, um, and a lot of like propaganda from the chemical company and they from the chemical lobby, and they don't get much information on the other side that says, hey, actually, we have concerns about the way these regulations are happening. Um, Another easy thing to do is, uh, you know, the book is really focused on the people and organizations who have been working on this issue for 20 years and have had some really big wins that most of us don't even know about that have helped to make us safer. And um, so we don't have to kind of start from scratch. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to figure this out on our own. So one of the easiest things to do is support them give some money to the organizations that are leading this work. Um, My book has an appendix with a big list of organizations that are working in different topic areas, but some of the big national organizations are the Cancer-Free Economy Network, 
um, the Children's Environmental Health Network and Breast Cancer Prevention Partners are three that come to mind. Um, and following those organizations on social media or getting their newsletters is also a great way to be ready to lend support to specific initiatives. So if a federal bill that would regulate a certain pesticide linked to cancer is up for consideration um, and you're following them on social media, you're gonna see like today is the day to call this Senator who isn't sure about his vote yet, or today is the day to sign a petition. And then you can get those out to additional people too. So that's another really easy way to support this stuff is follow those organizations and pitch in when there's like a timely request for change. Um, there's also a lot that you can do on the kind of very local level. I know that um, a lot of like municipal governments have started banning the use of pesticides in playgrounds and parks, for example, um, which can really help protect kids in your community and perhaps your own kids. Um, school boards are uh, responsible for initiating like healthy school initiatives that minimize the use of pesticides and toxic cleaning products and focus on ventilation. So kids are breathing clean air in their buildings while they're at school. Um, so if you have capacity to get involved at the local level, that can also feel really satisfying because you can have kind of like tangible effects that benefit you and your community a lot more quickly. And then the last thing is um, exerting some market pressure. So I think we're often, we give too much weight to shopping with our wallets as Americans sometimes, um, but uh, we are seeing that companies are responding to consumers wanting healthier versions of products, right? When you go to the store and you're looking at Clorox bleach right next to it is Clorox Greenworks, which is like a non-toxic version of the same cleaning product right there next to the toxic one. If you um, are doing that gradual switch thing we talked about, swapping out your old mascara or lipstick or lotion for a less toxic option, um, you can really amplify the impact of that by taking a couple extra minutes to let both companies know. So if you've been using the same hand cream your whole life, you love it, your mom uses it too. And then you find out it contains a bunch of ingredients that might be raising your cancer risk. So you decide to switch. Um, that company's not going to notice if you just stop buying their product. But if you take a second to post on social media or shoot them an email, same thing where companies very rarely hear from their customers. Um, so when they do, they're like, ah, <laughs> what's happening? Especially if it's a complaint. Um, if you send them a note or post on social media saying, I, you know, I love this product. I've stopped using it because it contains ingredients I'm concerned about. I'm switching to this one that doesn't, and I hope you'll change your formula. Um, that can really amplify the impact of those choices you're making in terms of what you're buying as a consumer. So that's good. That's all tangible, real stuff that people can do. Um, and I encourage everyone to do that. And in, in, um, her, her book in Christina's book, there's a whole list of organizations. Um, so when you read her book and then you send it to your, <laughs> your representative after you read it, um, make sure you check out those organizations too. The other thing I wanted to ask you your opinion on, you know, you, you talk a little bit about campaign finance changes and people talk about this all the time, but when you think about like, you're up against these lobbies that have so much money and so much influence over our elected officials. Like, do you think that'll ever change? Do you think we're making progress? It's just so frustrating on so many fronts. It's so frustrating. I agree with you. It's so frustrating. And I do think, um, you know, one category of organizations that I, I included in that appendix in my book is organizations that are working on campaign finance reform uh, because, I think that's a critical part of this, right? Is we need increased transparency in our government. We need to know who is giving them money and how that's influencing their decisions. We need to restrict the power of lobbyists. And uh, in terms of, <laughs> that's harder to be optimistic about, but I do think we've seen similarly some incremental wins and changes over the years in terms of what has to be disclosed, in terms of what we find out about, in terms of you know spending and, bribery and impropriety in this department. Um, and I, and it does give me some hope that there are numerous organizations that are really devoted to changing this and pushing for this. Um, and then of course, you know, supporting them with a donation of time or money and following those organizations is another way that we can help to power up those efforts. I think that's smart because we, we don't want to, what is, what do they call the corporatocracy or whatever corporations are running the show. It's it's sad, but that is happening in America. Um, 
Christina, thank you so much for this. This is very interesting. Uh, I guess my last question, where folks want to get your book or learn more about you, do you have a website? Can you tell people where to go? Yeah, I have a website. It's um, newwaroncancer.com or christinamarusic.com. My, my name is K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-M-A-R-U-S-I-C. Um, the book is available anywhere books are sold, uh, but you can get 20% off if you buy it from the publisher, which is Island Press, using the discount code WAR, W-A-R. It's also available as an audiobook. And um, if you read it, please leave a review. Reviews help other folks know if they might like the book or not. It's funny. I just started getting into audiobooks because I like to run and stuff. And I'm like, it's nice. I'm like, yeah, I, I love I, audiobooks. I never thought I'd get into it because I'm, and I, I'm not really big on eBooks because I like to feel a book and like, it's yeah. just, and I like to underline and remember things. And, um, I like to read in the bathtub. So I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, I never thought I'd get into audiobooks. And now I'm like my runs and stuff. I'm like, Oh, I like this. So me too. I always yeah. have like, like a physical book that I'm reading and yeah. then an audio book that I'm listening to at the same time. Cause then yeah. I can listen to it while I'm like cleaning the You're house cleaning, or yeah. washing dishes or whatever. Yeah. Yes, I'm a big fan of that. So good. Well, thank And I'll um, share your websites um, in the podcast description and stuff like that, but thank you so much for coming on. This was, was great. And I wish you a lot of luck with this campaign and also the book. Thank so. you so much. It's been really great talking yeah. to you and I appreciate it. Best of luck there in Pittsburgh. I haven't been there in so long. I think last Where are time you? I I'm in New York City now. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I've I've only been to big picks for for a wedding and then like a big comedy show. But um, okay, yeah. <laughs> but one day I, I I do my actually I do have a niece who's going to IUP. Oh yeah, that's, okay. that's not too far. I don't think right or is it? It's like I don't even know. It's an sad. hour, more than an hour. Okay, so not it's a little far. far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you should come. Pittsburgh. I love Pittsburgh. It's you beautiful. Do. Yeah. Um, I went to Hofstra University, so I lived on Long oh, Island. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Very nice. All right. All right. Well, thanks. And um, hopefully the world stays together. Uh, <laughs> Fingers like, crossed. Yeah, this has been lovely. Thank you so much for um, sure reading the book and having such thoughtful questions. I really I appreciate it. And I'll write a review too. <laughs> awesome. Sounds All fun. right. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. day. Bye-bye. You Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining in to the podcast. And like I said in the introduction, I'm curious to know how you feel about our chemical exposure now and what the new war on cancer should be. It's like a toxic chemical romance. Um, is that from Lady Gaga? Chemical romance? I think it is. Yeah, right? I think. Um, so out of it. All right. Please feel free to write me, Erin at bloomingwellness.com, bloomingwellness.com being my blog site, uh, or also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find all of the links for those sites in the podcast episode description or on my website. So take your pick. And if you're not into any of that, you can subscribe to my newsletter. And only because reviews are so important to help independent podcasts grow and be discovered by more people. If you can leave a review, particularly at Apple Podcasts, that would rock. All right. And now it's time for the closing quote. This one is from Cormac McCarthy. I recently posted this on my Facebook page and folks really seem to dig it. I dig it. So here it is. You never know what worse luck your bad luck has saved you from. Yeah, some good stuff right there. All right, guys, that's it for today. See you here next time. Bye for now.